if you are watching us on Facebook or on YouTube in the comment section. And if you're joining us via Zoom, you can do so in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you ha have any problems, you can also use the Q&A section, um, but you can also do that in the chat box as well, whichever one you prefer. And now, without any further ado, because um, I know everyone is excited about the discussion, I would like to introduce the Lithuanian ambassador of Lithuania to the United Kingdom, Renatas Norkas, for his welcoming remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Justa, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear, dear friends. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar, uh, which is jointly organized today by Lithuanian and Polish embassies in the United Kingdom. This year, we commemorate uh, the 230th anniversary of the common constitution of Lithuania and Poland and the adoption of the mutual pledge of the two nations. To mark such a significant date, the Lithuanian parliament declared 2021 as the year of the constitution of 3rd of May and mutual pledge of the two nations. The adoption of the constitution was a milestone, not only in the statehood of Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth. At the time of its birth in 1791, the constitution was a child of modernity, an example of the most progressive European political thought of that era. The constitution reflected the spirit of the enlightenment and is widely considered to be the first modern constitution in Europe. We regard it also as the Lithuanian constitution as it was seen as an act of revival of our country. The reforms promoted social and political developments in Lithuanian society. They also paved the way for the new opportunities for Lithuanian language and culture. It was the first political and legal document in the Lithuanian language. Today, we are pleased and honored to have prominent historians with us who will share their thoughts and observations on the significance of this document. Let me welcome Professor Robert Frost, a historian and academic uh, at the University of Aberdeen. He is also the founder of the Research Center for Polish-Lithuanian Studies at the University of Aberdeen. Also Professor Karin Friedrich, a fellow of the Royal Histori Historical Society currently holding the chair of the early modern European history at the University of Aberdeen. Both Robert and Karin have been longtime friends of Lithuania and Poland, greatly helping our two countries in sharing the history of Commonwealth in the United Kingdom and all over the world. Scotland, apart from being an incredible hundred shades of green land, has also become a home of thousands of Poles and Lithuanians, as indeed the United Kingdom. It's not a coincidence that the first research center for Polish-Lithuanian studies was established at the University of Aberdeen by Professor Robert Frost. Today, we are also connecting London with Warsaw and Vilnius, as we are joined by Professor Przemysław Żurawski Velgrajewski, a Polish academic and a member of the National Development Council appointed by President Andrzej Duda, and uh, Dr. Jolanta Karpavicenie, chief advisor to the president of Lithuania, head of education, science, and culture group. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, uh, it is also my exceptional pleasure to welcome Dr. Kristina Sabalowskaite, an art and culture historian specializing in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth period and one of the prominent contemporary Lithuanian writers, who only a few days ago was awarded a prize of the two nations. Congratulations to you, Kristina. Uh, she will be moderating our discussion today. La last but not least, we are very grateful to Minister Wendy Morton, Minister for European Neighborhood and the Americas at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Poland and Lithuania's ties with the United Kingdom have only grown deeper and stronger. Our shared commitment to transatlantic security embodied in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization exemplifies the depth of this relationship. Our people-to-people -people contacts have been growing strong and close also due to Polish and Lithuanian diasporas that study, work, and live in the UK. So many thanks, Minister, for joining us at the webinar today. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let me say how much we value its excellent cooperation with the Polish Embassy here in London. 
a couple of years ago, Ambassador Zagotsky and I were delighted to co-host uh, the event at the Lancaster House on the occasion of the 250th anniversary of the establishment of a permanent Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth diplomatic presence in the United Kingdom. Our embassies enjoyed day-to-day -day collaboration on so many diplomatic, cultural, and political matters, which helped keep the spirit of our Commonwealth alive and progressing for our strategic partnership, also between our two countries and United Kingdom. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again for joining for this, uh, I hope, very inspiring and interesting webinar and discussion. And now I have uh, my pleasure to pass over the floor to my colleague, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Arkady Chagotsky. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Your Excellency Ambassador Norkus, Minister Morton, Professor Robert Frost, Professor Karen Friedrich, um, Dr. Yolanta Karpavicane, Dr. Kristina Saboloskaite, Professor Przemysław żurawski grajewski ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's with great pleasure that I join in opening this webinar on the significance of the 3rd of May Constitution, organized to celebrate 230th anniversary of the first constitution, written constitution in Europe, and second only to the American Constitution. Last 3rd May, so two days ago, the Polish President Andrzej Duda hosted the official celebration in the Warsaw Royal Castle, in fact, Polish Historic House of Parliament. He was then joined by presidents of Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Ukraine. In opening this ceremony, he stressed the common heritage which uh, our countries share the heritage of freedom and independence embodied in the 3rd of May Constitution, a document which continues to inspire generation, first of all, from our region of Central and Eastern Europe. In fact, together we are stronger and together we can secure our freedom. Today, we take this opportunity to revisit this heritage of love of freedom, citizen, citizens' activity and independence, which we share and hope to draw from it inspiration. For it is both in reflecting common our past that we learn to build a better and stronger future. Today, we we'll remember on parliamentary and constitutional Scottish, English, British traditions and I'm so glad that we have Minister Morton with, with us. But today we will focus on the Polish-Lithuanian traditions and we'll focus on the, on, the, uh, 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 on the different experience of freedom and parliamentary, parliamentary traditions. So I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion between eminent experts on the Polish-Lithuanian Union and uh, that together with Ambassador Norkus, we have a pleasure to virtually host today. So thank you, uh, Ambassador Norkus, um, for, for your cooperation. And uh, Minister Morton, thank you very much uh, that, uh, that you join us today. Thank you for your presence. It's very important for both our, our countries, but also for all the region. Uh, and I would like to ask you about some, some words. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Zagotsky, and uh, thank you also, Ambassador Norcus, um, for the opportunity to join you today. Um, I have to say it's my absolute pleasure to be able to, to join you. Um, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth Constitution was momentous. Its separation of executive, legislative and judiciary powers was radical in a time of absolute monarchy. Since the restoration of democracy, Poland and Lithuania have worked together in that progressive spirit, setting an example to others of how to overcome historical obstacles and to nurture a shared appreciation for a common past and heritage. And the UK is honored to have walked that road beside you. During the dark days of Soviet influence, Britain played host to the Polish government in exile until the collapse of the Soviet Union. In recent years, 
we have celebrated the centenary of diplomatic relations between our countries and the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain, where the courage of Polish pilots will never be forgotten. As well as the 230th anniversary of the Constitution, this year also marks the 30th anniversary of the UK's recognition of the re-established state of Lithuania. During the Soviet occupation, the UK had hosted a legation of Lithuanian diplomats and refused to recognize the illegal occupation of Lithuanian territory. We were proud to be among the first nations to recognize Lithuania's re-independence in 1991. And we look forward to celebrating the anniversary in the summer and hopefully in person. But we have so much to look forward to together. We are making bold progress on some big challenges, crucially on COVID-19 recovery and on climate, as we look towards COP26 in November. Science and innovation underpin all our economies and our collaborations on health sciences, clean energy and on fintech, and will have benefits that travel way beyond our borders. And as democratic partners, we have the capacity to be a genuine force for good in the world. And today, in these unpredictable times, when democratic are under attack from multiple directions, our history to protect our freedoms and to preserve the need for bold and steadfast allies has rarely been greater. And it is an honor for the United Kingdom to count the Republic of Lithuania and the Republic of Poland as two of its closest friends. And so I look forward to celebrating many more anniversaries with you and to seeing the relationships between our countries continue to flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Minister for your kind words of, of welcoming and uh, absolutely enjoy uh, cooperation with the United Kingdom and Poland here in London and across the country. And we're looking forward to excellent uh, further continuous cooperation with you. Um, thank you very much. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Kristina Sabalowskaite, uh, who will from now on take, uh, take over the moderation of our seminar and the word goes to our historians. Uh, so thank you, Christina, again for joining us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure and excitement to moderate today's uh, webinar and discussion, which I think will offer unique insights due to the uh, unique speakers that we are hosting today. And uh, the first um, uh, speaker is Dr. Yolanta Karpavicena. She is currently a chief advisor to the president of Lithuania, head of education, science and culture group. She is also an associate professor at the Department of Ancient and Medieval History Faculty of History at the University of Vilnius. Her main fields of academic research include the history of cities and towns of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, reception of the Saxon Magdeburg law in the East Central Europe, and social history of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. For myself, I should also add that she is a renowned museologist and played the vital role in revi reviving uh, the palace of the Grand Dukes in Vilnius and the, as the vice director. So uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce her and she will share several insights about the significance of the constitution of the 3rd of May from the perspective of historical and current relations between Lithuania and Poland. Over to you, Yolanta in Vilnius. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Christina. Your Excellencies Ambassadors, dear Minister, dear participants and guests, Dear friends, it's a great honor and pleasure to be with you today and to congratulate you and all of us on a significant historical celebration. 
the 230th anniversary of May the 3rd Constitution. I would like to express sincere thanks to the embassies of Lviv and Poland in the United Kingdom, to the Research Center for Polish Lithuanian Studies at the University of Aberdeen, and to all the initiators and organizers of this event for a great opportunity to experience a festive mood, feel intellectual togetherness, and get involved in interesting and inspiring discussions. As back then in the epoch of May the 3rd Constitution, the Lithuania and Poland were flooded with advanced enlightenment ideas. Then the ambitious search for change was the force that led both countries forward. Because of the pandemic, we are geographically separated, but connected by modern technologies. Most importantly, we share, we share a common history, a common cultural heritage, and a common European identity. Lithuania and Poland have a centuries-old history. Vladislaus Jagiellos' marriage with Jadwiga and Christianization of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was a civilization choice. From its very establishment, Lithuania geopolitically balanced between the East and the West. At the end of the 14th century, Lithuania shifted towards Western European civilization and over time has taken over its fundamental values and cultural phenomena. As the famous Lithuanian historian, medievalist, Professor Edward Zgudavičius pointed out, Lithuania joined the Western civilization through Poland. The two countries were connected by a personal union embodied by the rulers of the Jagiellonian dynasty. The Union of Lublin established the polish lithuanian Commonwealth, one of the longest lasting political unions in the history of Europe. The common neighborly historical path was marked by ups and downs, disputes and discussions, search for peaceful coexistence and common fight against the same external enemies. But it was dominated by joint creativity and united by strategic partnership based on Western values. The shared understanding and responsibility for the present and future of this European region mobilizes, inspires, and connects the two countries today. The epoch of May the Third Constitution, inspired by the ideas of the French Revolution, demonstrated our predecessors' ambition and ability to adapt and promote the innovative ideas of enlightenment. The Constitution marked the peak of political, social, and economic reforms in the second half of the 18th century in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. It was born from European civilization and contributed to it as well. The constitution set out a new historical perspe perspective for Poland and Lithuania's development, modeled the division of state powers and the architecture for state modernization and society transformation based on progressive principles. The Constitution has demonstrated the intellectual power, political wisdom, and foresight, patriotism of state reformers and their civic and responsible attitude towards the destiny of the Commonwealth as well as that of Europe. This is valuable historical lesson given by our predecessors and symbolic testament and the main mandate to future generations. The four years same and its reforms were the first major step towards a common homeland for all citizens, despite their social status. The constitution defined the fundament fundamental principles of a modern civil society. Ustavozhendova was the message of the then parliament and progressive state leaders to fellow citizens and to the world 
uh, that the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth positioned itself at the forefront of constitutional thought. Poland and Lithuania share the honor of the first written fundamental law in Europe. May the third constitution stands next to the first written constitution of the United States and French Declaration of the Rights of Man on and of the Citizens. Mikhail Karpovich, in Lithuanian we say Nikolas Karpavichus, a contemporary of the constitution, famous preacher and professor at Vilnius University, who later became the Bishop of Bigri, said, quote, Ustava Zhendova is the work of brain and humanity, real freedom and independence. The new legislation as defined in the fundamental law of the state has given our nations the honor and authority in the eyes of entire Europe. It has demonstrated that we are committed to self-government and aim for legitimate happiness, which successfully underpins the foundation of real might and power for future generations." End of quote. The constitution was not the last accord of the four years same. The reform of the fundamentals of the state culminated in the adoption of the law Zazhenshenia of the Yemne Obuygan Rolov by the same on 20th October 1791. It has become a fundamental amendment to the constitution. According to the famous law historian Julius Bardach, this fortified the consolidation of the Polish and Lithuanian political nations. The status of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania as an equal partner of Poland in the federal dual state has been legalized. In this way, the tradition of historical sovereignty of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania has been preserved, but it has been aligned to the concept of centralization of state and modernization of society as defined in May the Third Constitution. Moreover, it was not just commitment to the This was evidence that the historical path of polish lithuanian relation is the art of compromise based on trust and tolerance. May the Third Constitution was also an impetus for the development of Lithuanian culture. Shortly after its adoption, the text was translated into Lithuanian language. This became the first legal document in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania written in Lithuanian. It's believed that the aforementioned Nikolas Karpavichus translated one of these sermons dedicated to the constitution into the Lithuanian language. This was the first piece of political prose written in Lithuanian. As Thomas Wenslova has rightly pointed out, quote, just after May the Third Constitution, a new space for the Lithuanian speaking culture was created, and that space had the potential to expand. End of staff of what? The Constitution has been in existence, existence for just over a year. It, is, it has become the fundamental part of constitutional modern tradition in Europe and worldwide. May the Third Constitution has left a distinctive footprint in the historical memories of the Polish and Lithuanian nations. In this case, the historical memory of Poles and Lithuanians was also different. Lithuanians needed time to rethink and find a new attitude towards Lublin Union, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, and May the Third Constitution, especially in the light of complicated relations between Poland and Lithuania in the first half of the 20th century. In recent years, Lithuania is undergoing, I would say, a renaissance of the Constitution, which testifies this document of epochal importance to have become, again, a significant symbol that embodies the neighborhood and togetherness of Poland and Lithuania in the past, present, and future. 
This favorable precondition has formed not only thanks to excellent nowadays diplomatic relations between Poland and Lithuania, strategic partnership and leadership in this European region, but also because of close cooperation between scientists uh, of the two countries. It's important to stress that researchers of other countries also join this academic community. I would like to take this opportunity to remind uh, the importance of today's event in one more aspect. One of the organizers and participants of this discussion, Professor Robert Cross, is attending uh, this event live. He is a founder and promoter of the Research Center for Polish Lithuania Studies at the University of Aberdeen, and he is an active researcher of the history of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. President of the Republic of Lithuania, Ditanas Nauseda, has bestowed the Cross of the Knight of the Order for Merits to Lithuania upon him for long standing academic activity and important work in promoting the history of Lithuania and Poland in the international discourse for close cooperation with Lithuanian scientists and the science and higher education institutions. It's a great privilege for me to thank the Hamburg professor once again for his long-standing work, commitment and outstanding merit enriching research of the history of Lithuania, Poland and all Europe. Thank you, dear Professor Frost, for the opportunity for Lithuanian researchers to present their studies abroad and for training the new generation of young scientists. I sincerely wish you creative success in your academic and social activity. The symbolic link will also be reflected in today's discussion. I wish uh, for it to become, quoting the Zhenshenia, the moment that returns us to our selves. End of quote. I wish you all deep insights, diversity of opinions, passion of the discussions, and joy of learning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yolanda Karpavicina. Uh, for, for your insights and your comments. And now I'm over to Professor Przemyslav Żurawski Belgrajewski in Warsaw, who is a prominent Polish political scientist and academic and associate professor at the University of Łódź. In 2015, he became a member of the National Development Council, appointed by uh, President Andrzej Duda. His main areas of research include international relations and geopolitics. And indeed, um, uh, looking through your keynotes today, I was astonished uh, how deep uh, you go back into the premises for the formation uh, of the constitution of the 3rd of May uh, of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, because it starts, in your opinion, from the Middle Ages and the democratic liberties of both nations. And we will also talk today about whether it was a bloodless revolution and how it does relate to today's geopolitics and Belarusia and Ukraine. Uh, the floor is yours, Pomosov. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I feel to be privileged and honored to have such a splendid opportunity to address uh, such an extraordinary audience uh, talking about the history of uh, the Commonwealth uh, of uh, Poland and Great Duchy of Lithuania. I would like to uh, divide my presentation into uh, three parts. The first one uh, will be devoted to the roots of the Constitution. Uh, with the uh, most important uh, goal to stress the fact that it was not just the uh, extraordinary and surprising product uh, of the epoch. However, of course, it was in that sense that it was the product of the uh, major enlightenment. Still, the roots were very long, and that was the outcome of the uh, long-lasting 
political process of the development of the political system of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And I hope you can uh, see the, the map uh, I have prepared. Please show them. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, showing the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at its peak in uh, 1621, uh, the climax of the political power and you can see it on the background of the present time borders in Europe. This explains us why so many peoples are authorized to claim that they are the heirs to the tradition, uh, because they were the members of parliament from all those lands, uh, a little bit smaller, because uh, the next map it will show you the uh, developments uh, that were reflected in the preamble to the constitution, please show the next map, uh, namely, uh, well, this is the, the map showing uh, the division between the Great Duchy of Lithuania and the uh, crown of the Polish kingdom, with the territories lost uh, for Russia uh, in uh, the 17th century, uh, so the country, when the constitution uh, started to be uh, prepared, was smaller even than in that map because it was after the first partition of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Nevertheless, uh, the preamble of the constitution mentioned the, uh, the uh, something is wrong in, in the. Well. I don't know what has happened. Am I here? Uh, oh. Can I please have any signal that I am still here because something happened to you? I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, well, so I can continue, yeah? Yes, of course. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, so uh, in the preamble of the constitution, <clears throat> uh, we have that statement that we are aware of the uh, long lasting disadvantages of our uh, political system uh, that brought a lot of uh, catastrophes to the country. And this map shows you those catastrophes, a lot of lands that were lost uh, for Russia, some for Sweden. Uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth survived uh, 87 years of permanent wars between 16, um, 1648 and um, 1735, uh, and uh, that devastated the country. The country with the long lasting uh, tradition of uh, political freedom, uh, the freedom that uh, started uh, with the Hungarian tradition, transferred to, first to Poland with Anjou dynasty in uh, the 14th century uh, that brought uh, both Ius Resistandi, that means the law to rebel against unlawful king, and then in uh, 1374, a kind of the rule that could be translated into the uh, Anglo-Saxon tradition as no taxation without representation. Uh, and then, um, please remember that the very Polish uh, Lithuanian Union started um, as a military alliance against uh, Teutonic that brought the sense of religion because we faced uh, Christians uh, that only covered imperialism with the symbol of Jesus Christ and uh, that military alliance combined uh, uh, Catholics and uh, all peoples of the region in order for an invasion. Uh, so that demanded mutual tolerance, the uh, uh, law that uh, all the, or the um, political system in Poland was transferred to the Great Union of Lithuania in 1413, uh, the second Polish Lithuanian Union, and then developed in the next uh, centuries with Neminem uh, Captivabimus Nisiure Victim, which is the equivalent of the Habeas Corpus Act, but was adopted in 1433, uh, uh, then with the uh, parliament uh, and uh, the parliament that dominated the political scene in uh, 
the epoch between 1454 and 1505. This is uh, nihil novi sub sole sine communio consenso, which means nothing here without the consent of the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, this is since 1505. Uh, so uh, then the uh, act of uh, religion tolerance uh, of uh, 1573 and the first kind of constitution, that means Henry's article uh, that were uh, elaborated when uh, Henri d'Anjou was elected, the first elected king of Poland since uh, 1570 uh, till the end of the existence of the Polish uh, the kings of Poland, great dukes of Lithuania, were elected by the north. And it was about 10% of population that enjoyed full citizens' rights. Uh, all of them could be elected, uh, the members of parliament or the kings, and all of them had the right to elect uh, them. That was, uh, one can say, the largest uh, community of free people in the world till uh, the United States came into being. And that was uh, the epoch of the 17th and 18th century wars that destroyed uh, the country. After 87 years of permanent war, the political culture, the uh, education, uh, the property uh, level of the people collapsed. And this is why and how the Commonwealth was remembered in the 18th century as the uh, anarchic country of uh, dark people. Uh, and Constitution of May the Third was a kind of renaissance of the greatest uh, uh, system, uh, political system of the Commonwealth. Uh, that was possible due to the um, wars uh, that engaged Russian armies, in the war against Sweden and war against Turkey. And uh, that gave us those dying moment that was written in the constitution to reform the country. And this is important. Please show next maps and next pictures. Yeah, this is the first partition of Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Then in that shape, territorial shape, the constitution was adopted. And please show the military pictures. Yeah, that is the final partition. And both uh, Poles and Lithuanians uh, wanted to reform the country, uh, solving all the time till uh, 1991, all the time the same problem, the same question, how to modernize the country within the system of Russian domination. And <clears throat> today, this challenge is the challenge of uh, Ukraine and Belarus. The <clears throat> Republican system, liberty-based system of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, that was a challenge to uh, authoritarian monarchs in the region, just like uh, the uh, successful uh, reforms uh, in Ukraine or in Belarus, if happened, would be the challenge for the Putin's regime today. And this is why it uh, provoked the uh, invasions and the wars. Uh, and the main conclusion is that to reform the country, we need the effective military protection, which is, is the uh, background for our today uh, thinking about uh, NATO, about uh, military uh, capacity to uh, protect our countries. And the last sentence, uh, the heritage of the um, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, and the constitution of May the third is important as well due to the fact that that was uh, Heritage of uh, freedom, and one of our thinkers of the century, while commented it and uh, comparing to the French Revolution, said about French Revolution, "What a strange idea to abolish nobility! You should nobilitate everybody." That means the revolution that is based on evolution and bloodless, and on uh, advancing the level of uh, the people and not reducing it to the lower classes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, uh, for your insights, especially for the final thesis, with, which seems very, very relevant today. And now uh, we are about to start the discussion. And with my great, great pleasure, I introduce two people whom I know quite 
a while already and admire both of them very much. And this is Professor Robert Frost, who is um, a very renowned historian, a pupil of Norman Davis. And uh, a long, a long time uh, friend of Polish, uh, of Poland and Lithuania, and one of the best experts in the world on Polish um, Lithuanian Union and Commonwealth history. Currently, he holds the Bernard Fletcher Chair of History at the School of Divinity, History and Philosophy at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, he has earned his doctorate in the School of Slavonic of and East European Studies at the University College London, UCL, and is a foreign member of the Polish Academy of the Arts and Sciences and a British Academy member. And as ha has already been mentioned, he's also uh, the founder of the Research Center for the Polish-Lithuanian Studies at the University of Aberdeen. Whereas uh, Professor Karen Friedrich is a German historian, a professor in history at the University of Aberdeen Skin College. And she received MA in history and political science from uh, Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich in 1989 and PhD in history from Georgetown University. She has uh, widely published on the history of Poland, Lithuania, Commonwealth, Prussia especially, and the Holy Roman Empire from the 16th to the early 19th century, focusing both on social and cultural aspects, court culture, history of religion and political ideas. Uh, we shall probably start with Professor Frost and his remarks. And I know that Professor Frost, uh, as he confessed um, uh, himself, uh, uh, his main is interest is uh, the um, history of mentalities or histoire de mentalité. So I shall start with my qu first question. In terms of history of mentalities, uh, uh, the constitution of the 3rd of May, um, was it the collision between the new thinking and the old thinking? In other terms, how radical it was. Well, thank you, Christina, for, for that question, which I think goes to the heart of the problem we're discussing today. Because the Constitution can seem on paper and has seemed to many scholars not to be terribly radical in the context of the Enlightenment, in the context of the American Constitution, which was agreed in 1787, or the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen that was established in France in 1789 and the basis for the Constitution of September 1791. If you look at the Constitution, it begins by emphasizing that Roman Catholicism is the dominant religion, as it's put in the English translation, in Poland. It says that there are penalties that will be exacted for apostasy from um, in the constitution. And in, the, in an enlightenment, which particularly in France and in other Catholic countries has mounted an attack on the Catholic church in many respects, it seems strange to have a, an enlightened constitution emphasizing the position of the Catholic faith. It, in its second article, it goes on to emphasize the position of the Schlachta, the nobility, who have been the citizens of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth excluding, so it is always said, the burghers and of course the peasants. And the constitution does say that it will uphold the law of the urban law that has already been passed by the four year same. And it says that it will bring the peasantry under the protection of the law. But in many respects compared with these other constitutions that does not seem terribly radical. But if you think about the context of this constitution, I would suggest that in many respects, it is very radical indeed in the context of the Polish-Lithuanian Union. And we have to remember that that is a radically consensual system that at times has been paralyzed by the logical extension of the principle of unanimity, that one person, one envoy to the same can destroy the same, can break the same 
and stop legislation. So to get a reform passed at all, it has to make the people bringing that reform to the table have to make compromises. In many respects, the constitution of the 3rd of May is a compromise, but it's a comp compromise that's designed to address the major problem of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which everybody's agreed on. There are differences of opinion about how to cope with that problem, but the problem is government. And we should note that as has been stressed before today, that the constitution is not called a constitution. It's called the Ustava Zondowa, the law on government, because that has been the principal problem facing the Polish-Lithuanian Union from the very outset. In 1569, the Union of Lublin is quite clear. It creates not a state, not a union state. It creates one republic that is formed of two states and two nations. Now, that means that Lithuania has um, equality of status with Poland, which was what the Lithuanians wanted in 1569, and they got it. But it left unresolved the problem of how do you govern two states and two nations? Now, in this Commonwealth, the Commonwealth was a republic, and it was a republic that was based on classical Renaissance thought, the idea of the mixed form of government. Now, we heard that the Constitution of 3rd of May introduces the idea of the um, separation of powers, the balance of powers between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And yet, in a sense, the ideology of the Republic before the Enlightenment was one of balance because the, it built its political thought on the idea of the mixed form of government, the classic Aristotelian form in which the king's power was balanced by the power of aristocracy and balanced by the power of the populace, the people, but narrowly defined as ordinary members of the nobility. Now, the problem in that emerges as the king. When you elect foreign monarchs, can you trust them? And can you trust them to govern? And that is the major problem that the Ustava Zondova seeks to address. And I think if you look at the constitution in that context and think about what it's doing, you have to look at it not just in the context of the um, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and its development since 1569, you have also to look at it in the context of the four-year diet, the four-year same, because it is not the end of the story. It is designed to open the way to reform on a number of fronts. It's the rules of the game, if you like, and the, it incorporates certain aspects of uh, certain legislation of the four-year same, but it opens the way to reform. And if you look at the way the constitution is worded, often what is important about this document is not just what it says, but how it says it and what it doesn't say. And let's just look at a couple of examples before I end my answer to your question, Christina. It says the penalty, let's look at religion. It says the penalties for apostasy remain in force. And then it goes on to say, but you can be a member of any Christian sect you like. And that was taken up by um, you know, the Times in London on the 16th of May. So this is, this is great, if I can quote, it says, every man who professes the Christian religion may be of whatever sect he pleases and adopt whatever mode of worship which he shall prefer to others. So it's taken to be religious toleration. So what's this about apostasy? Well, the penalties for apostasy, I would suggest, that refers to apostasy to Judaism or Islam. Only two people are ever executed, you know, penalty for apostasy is death, but only two people are ever ex executed for apostasy. One, um, Christina um, in 1539, and the other one in 1749, but we only know about it through Jewish sources, it's not in the Polish sources. So, Reading the, the constitution, you think, well, that sounds pretty bad and not very enlightened. But this is, they have to have something on religion in there because there are Catholic bishops and many, many Catholics in the same who want this there. And let's look at what it says about the Schlachter. 
Um, it's interesting because the 1791 translation into English gives the justification for the preeminence of the Schlachter, which is what the constitution actually says. Uh, it says it's as the first founders of our liberties. But what the Polish says is Jako fundatorów rządu wolnego, of free government. And we come back to that question of free government. And finally, to end, what does it say about the peasants? Well, it takes them under the protection of the law. What does that mean? Well, it says an interesting thing. It says that it will uphold contracts made between the lords and their peasants. Now, in many respects, that is very interesting. It opens the way to the peasants, maintaining that once a contract is given over what rent they pay in labor service or whatever, that contract is to be protected by law. The constitution doesn't say how, but it opens the way to a set of legislation that may liberate the peasantry. We don't know what would have happened after 1792 because the outwork of the same was rudely ended. And you could say the same about the burghers, but I'll leave the burghers to Professor Friedrich because she knows much more about the burghers than I do. But I think this is a very radical document, partly for what it doesn't say as much as what it does. Another thing that the text of constitution of the 3rd of May that does not say, it does not mention the union between the Poland and Lithuania. Again, the omission. And you were talking about that it was designed um, on how to govern this state, this body, but again, Lithuania uh, as part of the union is omitted. And I think that um, later, especially during the second part of the 20th century, that gave uh, grounds on a lot of speculations, uh, at least in Lithuanian Soviet historiography. Since we are not mentioned, it's insignificant for us. I would like to hear a few thoughts on this subject, on the omission of the union between the Poland and Lithuania in the document. Again, that is the major omission. And it is, as you say, Christina, it has caused great comment and it has led to the idea that effectively the constitution overturns the Union of Lublin, that Lithuania is integrated into a unitary state. Because the solution to the problem of government that the constitution lays out and the four year same lays out is to make central government more effective. And you want to set up one treasury commission, one army. And it's quite clear that there are certainly people who desire the creation of a unitary state out of this republic of two nations and two states. The king is one. Poniatowski, as Professor Butowick Pawlikowski has long established, was very much influenced by the British state. And what the British state does in 1707 is create a unitary state in which the status of Scotland is far reduced from that of Lithuania under, in, in 1569. They're often compared, 1569, Union of the Parliaments in the Commonwealth, 1707, Union of the Scottish and English Parliaments. But the Scots are a poor and weak country. They only get 45 MPs in the British, new British Parliament in 1707, 16 of their peers. They can't affect anything. The Lithuanians can, and the Lithuanians are important, and the Lithuanians are far wealthier at least among the great magnates, than the Scottish nobility. So this is what Poniatowski looks at. And he says, we need to have this unitary state. Our equivalent of Westminster must rule because that's the only way we can get coherence to this. And there are Poles who look back to 1569 and say, look, we should have incorporated Lithuania then and we'll do it now. That's, you know, let's have everything unitary. Lithuania will just be a province like Małopolsko and Wielkopolska. And you can think that by saying, oh, well, it says nothing about the Rzeczpospolita Obojga Narodów, the Republic, the Commonwealth of the two nations, which is what Lublin forms. And yet there are little hints in the texts. Sometimes they are missed by the text. At one point, the English translation talks about the way in which the, common, the constitution will preserve the state the civil liberty and the good order of society, where it actually doesn't say the state. That's the way that the English translation interprets it. The 
Ustava Jondova does not, I would suggest, create a unitary state on the British model. At times it does talk when it talks about the burghers and in one or two other places, it talks about states plural, painst, not painst, you know, not painst vor. And so it does not actually demolish the union. And this is made clear in this guarantee, the mutual guarantee of the 20th of October, which is part of the legislation of the four year same, which says, yeah, the union still exists. And in many respects, what the solution to the problem is, is not to, to deconstruct the system of government before, because what Lublin has established is that yes, there are two systems of government, there are two law sets of laws and legal systems, there are two um, sets of ministers who are of equal, who are equal in status. Um, but government of the Commonwealth before, throughout the period after 1569, is conducted by the king and the ministers of Lithuania and the ministers of Poland are present at the king and it's effectively the Senate Council that decides on policy, which is then implemented. I said in, my, in the first volume of my history that it's a common administration rather than a common government um, of Poland, Lithuania. And the Lithuanian ministers administer Lithuania, the Polish ministers administer Poland. But there has been a question about the power of the crown and the constitution of 3rd of May addresses that and solves it. The Lithuanians actually get um, double representation with the Poles in the vital treasury commission. They want a separate treasury commission, but there's actually one, but they are to be greatly overrepresented to protect Lithuania's interest when it comes to government, to matters monetary, which is key. So no, it doesn't destroy the union, but it creates a new mode of government for what is a republic, a republic with a king in the old sense, but in an age in which republican constitutions are emerging. So I think I'll stop there because I've probably gone on too long, but that would be my answer. Uh, my, my next question, question probably will be for Professor Friedrich, because we're talking about, you know, self-government and how to govern, but um, the constitution of the 3rd of May takes place after the uh, Poland-Lithuanian partition already. And one of the most interesting parts, and I would say that in some se senses, um, uh, somewhat a driving force for the self-government in, 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 uh, in the form of the city of Gdansk, who was in uh, an example in the whole of the Royal Prussia. So the Royal Prussia is already after the partition does not belong to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, anymore. It is sort of left behind. So in your opinion, because you are an expert on the wider context, uh, in your opinion, what role does it play? And also a little bit about the union with Prussia, which was also one of the uh, premises of the constitution of the 3rd of May, the, this movement in the wider context with the Prussia. Yes, thank you, Christina. Um, what uh, Professor Frost just said about the Lithuanians in the 18th century, particularly around the time of the constitution, there were, of course, um, people, particularly in the city of Gdańsk, uh, who were quite keen on uh, trying to depict themselves as a, a member of this union, uh, perhaps on par with the Lithuanians. But of course, that was never the case because we have to go back there uh, to the 15th century, where uh, the royal Prussians, the Prussian cities, and the, the nobles. Um, uh, rebelled against the Teutonic Knights in, in 1454. And um, the, the Western part of Prussia was uh, then incorporated into the Polish crown. So it was never a, a separate state. Um, it was actually, it became part of the Polish crown and the, the Royal Prussian nobles and burghers uh, uh, consented to that. They, they wanted to join the Polish crown in their rebellion against Teutonic Knights. Of course, we know by 1525, the Eastern part of Pr Russia was uh, be became um, uh, 
a duchy uh, under the Protestant Hohenzollern, uh, Albrecht of Hohenzollern, a duke. And so therefore Prussia was essentially uh, divided into two parts. Uh, what would help here perhaps is the map, if you wanted to br briefly show that, uh, that would be great. Uh, the first map, um, the first slide uh, would be very useful because that would show you um, geographically, you know, how it looks like. Um, so the, the pink territory um, here is uh, the ducal is ducal Prussia under the Hohenzollern under Hohenzollern rule, and the light green territory um, is uh, the uh, is is the territory of Prussia Krulevsky, uh, Royal Prussia that joins uh, from 1454 in the rebellion against the Teutonic Knights, uh, the Polish crown, um, and uh, that is a very important territory, obviously also for Poland, um, in and Lithuania. Um, as a, as the, the access to the Baltic, so that's that that is that's important. But what is even more important is that this territory and its nobles and burghers um, were guaranteed self-government, uh, not like Lithuania as a separate state, but within the Polish crown, they retained uh, um, a same a representative body where. Uh, in contrast to the Polish tradition, uh, the burghers, the cities, particularly the large cities, Gdańsk, Elbląg and Torun, were represented, they had a voice there, they had a seat there, and actually they were leading political voices within that body. So, and that of course was uh, very well uh, reflected, um, and again here I connect with what uh, Professor Frost said earlier, um, the forma mixta, because uh, the burghers saw themselves as citizens of uh, the, the the republic of um, the the Zetsch Pospolita of the Commonwealth, and and there was a place for the burghers there, and therefore there was a certain sense, in fact, that they were a little bit better, you know, that they had a better constitution than the Polish cities, certainly, and also the Polish constitution as a whole, um, that that they had uh, a voice there in in these in these bodies, um, and they had they developed a very strong identity of self-government uh, of um, identity with their own laws with their own uh, uh, bodies of, of jurisdiction as well particularly in the cities uh, they had uh, also uh, liberties uh, Gdańsk, Elbląg and Torun for example had from 1557 uh, the free exercise of the Augsburg Confession and uh, they had also the use indigenatus that only uh, their you know people born in in royal Prussia uh, among the nobility could hold offices in royal Prussia, not foreigners, not poles who were appointed there, and so there was a, a strong identity within a. Uh, Royal Prussia, Prussia Krolevskia, uh, as a as a cry, as a la, as a land, as a country. Uh, Karol Gurski has uh, has emphasized that a, a, a cry, a land of the Polish crown, with an eye for difference and detail, and they defended very strongly their what they saw as their autonomies and as their separate special laws and and their self government, and. The other identity that really developed here, which which is important, is the the contrast to the other part of Prussia, um, the, the Ducal Prussia, uh, which by 1657 um, became sovereign under the whole, under Hohenzollern rule under the Duke, uh, then Frederick uh, William the Great Elector, who essentially abolished the old constitution where the nobles and also the, the city of Königsberg, Krolevitz, uh, had a voice uh, and had a parliamentary presentation, representation, it weakened that voice of, of the citizens uh, and therefore weakened the, the, the civic traditions that existed also in the eastern part of Prussia and established essentially a, absolute Absolutum dominium, absolute monarchy, without yet being a monarch. That only happened in 1701. So the two parts of Prussia moved away from each other in, in political culture. And that's important because they, uh, in, in, in Prussia Kulevsky, in Royal Prussia, they took a great um, dislike of uh, absolute monarchy. They had the example at their doorstep. Uh, and um, Although uh, the, the Rechtsstaat is a state of law, that they followed laws, uh, they were treated, the, the citizens of 
uh, Ducal Prussia were treated not as citizens, but as subjects. And that was a, a big difference here in the political culture. Just to give you an example, Frederick William, the great elector of Brandenburg, wrote about his rebellious cities and nobles in the duchy in 1661, when they protested against uh, the sovereignty uh, of, of, of the Hohenzollerns, that it was time that the people's mouth be stuffed. Uh, and in contrast to that, the sons of royal Prussian nobles and burghers were taught in their schools in royal Prussia, in Prusy Kurolevsky, that, quote, the will of the whole city must be represented and everything in a mixed republic is determined by fundamental laws. So they, they really subscribed to that form of mixta that was just uh, uh, described by Professor Frost. I, I stop here for the moment. I think we have a raised hand from uh, Professor Przemyslav uh, uh, Grajewski. Well, are, are we, are we uh, answering the questions now or are we leaving them afterwards? What would be your suggestion, the panelists? Uh, to, to add one sentence to what just has been said, I think interesting for the Lithuanians. Of course, the uh, scale of liberties of the cities in the Great Duchy of Lithuania and the other parts of the Crown were not that large as in the uh, Royal Prussia. Nevertheless, during the uh, Russian disastrous invasion of 1654-1660, the cities in the Great Duchy of Lithuania, due to, due to the fact that they were a kind of small uh, Bulgars republics, uh, they didn't enjoy the citizens' rights of the republic, but they enjoyed the citizens' rights of the cities, which was uh, unknown in Russia. Yeah? So whenever there were uh, city walls, if they had any uh, chance to uh, defend them, uh, they stand very hard. And today this is a part of the uh, tradition uh, that uh, was reviving in Belarus, pointing on the uh, city citizens' uh, uprisings uh, against Russia in Mohilov at that epoch. So that uh, political sense that we are citizens, maybe not the entire republic, but of our city, where we enjoy the uh, citizens' rights. Uh, that was something that uh, motivated people uh, to defend uh, the country in their small pieces of the country whenever they can. So this is something characteristic for Lithuania at that time of the 50s of the 60s. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Professor Frost. Any comments after the uh, remark about the wider reaction? Because Russia was mentioned, but uh, my next question was uh, in general, what was the impact and what was uh, the reaction uh, to the constitution of the 3rd of May in the countries? around the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, because at the same time we have a quite heated uh, geopolitical situation in Europe, and that concerns also its nearest neighbors. So I would like to hear your insights on that. Yes, um, well, unless we know all too well the reaction of the near neighbors. And, and in here, in this, and. Professor Friedrich can probably add more to this than I, Prussia plays the role of the weasels because at the start of the four year same, uh, when Russia goes to war with, uh, with Turkey and Sweden, the Prussians sort of get all chummy and close up with Poniatowski and the Polish government and say, oh, we'll support you. Now let's remember the background to this, that if you'd looked at the start of Poniatowski's reign, in the 1750s and early 1760s, the three powers that became the partitioning powers were at loggerheads. Prussia was fighting against Russia. And during the Seven Years' War, it looked very certain for a while that Prussia would be partitioned, not Poland, Lithuania, because Russia was its enemy and was advancing on Berlin. But then, thanks to pure happenstance, Peter III, who has a great admiration for Prussia, inherits the Russian throne and turns around to Frederick the Great, whom he admires and says, let's make peace. But that alliance was unstable. The first partition has 
created a sort of alliance, but Prussia is worried in the late 1780s and so encourages the Poles to go on and do some reforms. But once it sees the constitution and the idea that Poland, Lithuania could have an army of 100,000, that could be a threat to Prussia. And so Prussia turns and says, let's have the second partition, which only Prussia and Russia take part in. And then the third partition happens. So the neighbors, the absolute monarchies that surround it, Catherine the Great, the supposed great enlightened monarch, is a Russian monarch who certainly will not allow any enlightenment to change the government of Poland. And so she in, inter, intervenes and destroys, um, helps destroy the, the Commonwealth. But elsewhere in Europe, it's quite clear that although what I said about at the start about how this may not seem a terribly enlightened constitution by scholars looking back and saying, oh, well, the enlightenment's not about religion and sustaining Catholicism and all of that, and it doesn't do enough for the peasants. At the time, it was very much seen as being part of this great political change that was symbolized by America, that was symbolized by the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And the most interesting, you know, the reaction in England is almost, and Britain was almost entirely favorable to the constitution. It sees it in this context. And the, the Whigs, the um, ancestors of the liberals in, in Britain welcome it. And the most interesting figure is Burke, Edmund Burke. Burke, who's a Whig, who has supported the American Revolution, but has already come out and condemned the French Revolution because it's done on abstract principle. It's done on woolly declarations about the rights of man and so on. And Burke thinks this is dangerous and will lead to violence, but he very much approves in his letter from the new to the old Whigs. He very much approves of the constitution. He says, look at what's happened in Poland. The reason he doesn't like what the French are doing is that it's out, completely out of their traditional political system. They're trying to redraw politics from, on the basis of abstract principles. And he says, that's dangerous. But he says the Polish constitution is trying to preserve and render and deal with problems within the Polish system, but it is based on the Polish system. Burke believes that constitutional systems should grow, he talks about slow coral-like growth within the logic of their own history. That's why he likes the constitution. And that's general. So it is seen as a great enlightened document in many ways. That's part of this wave of reform but it's brought to an ugly end because the neighbors don't agree. But then as we know, Russia has been interfering in other people's politics for a very long time indeed. Professor Friedrich, your yes. opinion on the uh, Polish and Lithuanian uh, union with the Prussia, a few comments on, on that. Just, yes. Uh, Mostly it is regarded as one of the fatal mistakes that the Poles and Lithuanians did. Yes, well, I think they didn't have much choice at the time. Um, I think they, they turned to Prussia uh, because they had no other um, way out. I mean, they knew that they couldn't really turn to Russia, although there were, of course, supporters of Russia within Poland, uh, as we know, in Poland, Lithuania. Uh, but I think that the, the, the alliance with Prussia was an interesting one. Um, there was a lot of resistance against that. Um, just to, to give you an example, um, Stanislav Stasitz, um, you know, one of the fathers of the constitution, uh, was actually born in, in, in Royal Prussia, in Prusy Królewskie, in Polish Prussia, in Piwa. Uh, and uh, he, um, under the impression really of his experience of uh, what what Prussia had done, Hohenzollern Prussia had done to his own country, um, where um, you know, uh, serfdom was imposed, where people were abducted and pressed into the Prussian army across the border. And there are lots of examples of that. Uh, he uh, was very much in favor of um, uh, a Republican, the Republican side of the constitution. He he actually struggled. He he, he uh, quarrelled with, with with Hugo Kowontai, who was a, in, in contrast to Stashitz, was a strong defender of the alliance with Prussia. Uh, Kowontai, for example, said in 1788, "We should not condemn the memory of Frederick II. I see the king from a different point of view and consider him a descendant of Albrecht of Hohenzollern, a relative of the Jagiellonian family." 
may we Poles remember how grateful we have to be to this family and uh, what we owe to them. So it was of seeing the, the, the Prussian regime in a con in continuation from the from the Jagiellonians, very interesting point of view. Staschitz was very much against that uh, and said um, uh, Frederick II had been uh, the very first among the despots who divvies up our nation as if it was a herd of cattle. So you see there was a, a whole debate going on actually within uh, Poland-Lithuania, especially also within Royal Prussia, about this uh, alliance with the Prussians. And of course, uh, we said they had the experience of 1772 uh, and, and Frederick II's um, uh, measures uh, of, of uh, spoiling uh, the um, the trade relations with very high tariffs, with the cordon sanitaire, with uh, with with influencing you know the, the economy by by uh, um, swamping the country with bad currency and so on. So a lot of hostile acts. So uh, therefore, the, the the alliance with Prussia was not something that was perhaps naively done, but uh, partly because of of necessity. Uh, and uh, you could also see from the reactions, particularly of the proud burghers of of Danzig or. Dainsk um, after uh, the, the second partition, 1793, there is a good example, um, Johanna Schopenhauer, uh, you know, who was a, a, a Danzig merchant's family, uh, the mother of the famous philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, she wrote uh, memoirs and she uh, said about the Prussian army in 1793, um, uh, she compared the Prussian forces that occupied the city to a vampire who consigned my city to complete ruin, bleeding it dry, and spoke about the anger of the citizens and the helpless rebellion against the hated Prussian invaders. Um, when they had to uh, swear an oath to the, the, the Hohenzollern authorities in 1793, the burghers of Danzig turned out in black coats in a symbolic protest uh, as a sign of mourning and even even in the 19th century, many Danzig living rooms still adorned, were still adorned with pictures of the Polish kings later. So there was a, clearly a, a, a very strong reaction against the Hohenzollerns and in defense of the liberal constitution, which they never enjoyed, um, you know, the 1791 constitution. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we have one question from the audience, from Professor Antony Polonsky. Uh, from the end of the Great Northern War, Poland Lithuania had been under Russian domination. The four years same and the constitution of the 3rd of May was an attempt to end this domination. Did it have any change of success? So maybe Professor Frost will answer this. Yes, in many respects, the whole work of the four years same was designed to create um, a republic that could resist Russian pressure. I mean, it's interesting because, of course, Stanislav August Poniatowski was elected king partly at the behest of Russia. He was Catherine II's former lover, and she had this quaint idea that putting her former lover in charge of Poland would bring Poland to heel. It didn't. And Poniatowski tries to convince Catherine and Russia that Poland could help it, that it needed a strong Poland on its border and an alliance with a reformed Poland. But he fails. He makes one last attempt before the four years same in a famous meeting with Catherine on the barge on the, uh, uh, on the Dnieper River. Um, we don't know what they said to each other, but it seems that like many um, discussions between former lovers, the talks did not go well. Um, but the king is associated with, in many people's minds with, the, um, with Russian domination, the Confederation of Bar rises up in the 1760s. And this is the lesser nobility rising up against what it seems as obedience to, to the Russians. And that's why Michal Vyadorsky asks Rousseau to write his suggestions for the reform of Poland. Now, did it have a chance of success? Well, Tony, I would say that one of the problems is bad timing. That the constitution comes out just at the point that in France the revolution goes in the very direction that Edward Burke had warned Edmund Burke had warned it would go in, because in Poland you have a situation that the king is very much involved in the process, and of course the constitution increases the power of the central government and defines the role of the king, so nobody's afraid of him anymore. In France, Louis the Sixteenth 
rejects the advice of Mirabeau. Mirabeau comes to Louis the 16th in 1789 and says, look what uh, one year of liberty has, in 1790, and says, look what one year of liberty has done for the power of the monarchy in France. It has swept away the parlements. It's swept away the provincial estates. It has given, it realizes, take on the revolution and run with it and your power will be increased. And Louis says, yes, 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 I'll go along with the revolution. I'll go along with the revolution. And then he runs away from it. Just in 1792, as the constitution, in 1791, as the constitution is ready, three months before the constitution is ready, a month after the Polish constitution is passed, he runs away to Varennes and is brought back. And then he accepts a constitution that says, let's declare war on the rest of Europe because they'll beat the French and they don't. And the French revolution radicalizes and that gives Catherine the excuse to say, this is radical revolution in Poland. I will intervene to stop it and save you all from the bloodthirsty Jacobins that are in power in Poland. So it's bad timing. If that had not happened in France, I think there's a chance that it could have worked. But Gdyby is not Gdyby. history. My, my other insight would be that indeed it was such a bad timing and also the clash of personalities because a few more years later, Catherine II was dead. Yeah. The, there was Paul, her son, on the throne, who was very keen on Stanislav August Poniatowski and even imagined himself as his illegitimate child. So that would have been a much more favorable uh, grounds for the constitution and the further development. And, and could I make one more point about that? Because it's something that I could have said earlier about the radicalism of the constitution, because in many ways, the constitution of the 3rd of May, I think, represents in some respects an extension of the famous execution movement of the 16th century, the movement for the execution of the laws, which sought to ground the power of the ordinary nobility against the power of the magnates, the great wealthy families, because it sought in the 16th century to recover all the lands that the crown had alienated to the great magnates who had then waxed rich on the matter. Now the Union of Lublin partly comes about because the ordinary Lithuanian Schlachter, the ordinary Schlachter signed this partition in, the, in 1562 saying, we want the same liberties as the Polish nobles. We are middling nobility. Um, we are not terribly rich, but we don't want to be ruled by the Radvila family. We don't want to be ruled by a handful of tiny magnet wealthy families. Now, the deal that's made at Lublin has one problem. It says that the execution of the laws will not take place in Lithuania, in the lands that had been part of Lithuania in, before 1569. And that grounds the power of the magnets. Now, the confederation of, the, of Bar is partly anti-magnet. And I think the constitution sets out to limit magnet power. And one of the things that the Folia same announces is it's gonna sell off the royal lands that have still been let out of Starostva to um, the great magnets. And English opinion, British opinion thinks this is great. They think that this will break the problem. So in many respects, what the constitution is trying to do is restore, and it emphasizes it very strongly, the equality of the nobility. We are all equal in law, but we don't have titles. And who is it that runs away to Catherine? It's great magnates who see their power being broken. They are the traitors of Targovica. Many of the magnates do actually support the constitution, but there are those who see throughout that this is, because the wars between 1648 and 1721 have hit the middle in Schlachter hardest across the country and if I and they recover uh, in the 18th century and their voice is heard again and if I can end by bringing that back to the, the question of Lithuania I think that would significant have been of significant importance in Lithuania because in Lithuania there is still as was pointed out before um, an ability that speaks both Polish and Lithuania and we heard about the constitution being translated quickly into Lithuania if there were Lithuanian nobles who still remembered the Lithuanian and spoke it. It was the middling ordinary nobility, not the great families who had become 
entirely polonized, but then we're coming to the end of our time. And the yeah. question about well, what well. the term Polish and Lithuanian meant in 1791 is a moot one because they meant entirely different things from what they meant in 1881, 1921, and 1991, and 2021. But that's a, a, a discussion for another day, I suspect. <laughs> Uh, our time is almost up. We have uh, a, a few more questions. We have a raised hand from Professor Przemyslav um, Żurawski Velgrajewski, and we also have one more question. So the floor is over to you, Professor Żurawski. Thank you very much. I would like just add some remarks to what uh, has been said. Uh, first, uh, remember that the main challenge was how to reform country uh, in the, the permanent threat of Russian invasion. So the question of timing uh, was both favorable and uh, dangerous. Time, uh, favorable because of the already mentioned wars with Sweden and Turkey that uh, tied Russian hands, they could not uh, interfere immediately. And unfavorable due to all those circumstances connected with the uh, French Revolution. Still, uh, Another important remark is that, that medium class uh, nobles that were ruined by 87 wars uh, of 17th and the first uh, decades of 18th century uh, managed to recover and little bit, a little bit. They were much more uh, economically independent than, than used to be several decades earlier. Uh, so they ceased to be the clients of the great magnates in that uh, scale that they used to be in the previous epoch. Another important factor is uh, military academy, Szkoła Rycerska, uh, that uh, supplied the political elites of the country with, uh, with uh, well-educated uh, officers and a kind of political game, uh, the Polish uh, elites said to Russia, we are raising our army in order to be your ally in war against Turkey. They are not against you. This is why uh, Stanislav August Poniatowski built the monument of uh, Jan uh, uh, III Sobieski, the uh, victorious king of the Vienna uh, battle uh, against Turks. Yeah, that was the symbol that we are coming back to that tradition. But when you have the army, then the discussion is on another level. Yeah? Uh, so uh, that was a kind of the game. Uh, and uh, adding another remark to uh, as far as Prussia is concerned, the contradiction between Poland and Prussia was inevitable. Please remember about the technical condition of the epoch. Vistula was the main uh, route for green trade abroad. And Prussia cut off the, with the uh, custom borders, uh, the main source of the richness of the country. And of course, uh, when we come back to uh, 1309, when Teutonic Order robbed the, uh, the um, uh, farther uh, later on uh, Royal Prussia. That was the main um, point in the national policy program that survived the change of dynasties to take that land back to Poland. Yeah? So that was a factor uh, that shaped the nation at the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, that was something unforgettable in that sense. Yeah? So I think both sides, uh, Prussians and Poles, were aware of the fact that at the end of the story, there will be war. <laughs> For, uh, for Gdańsk that wanted to be a part of the Commonwealth and for the entire territory that was crucial for the economy of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our time, unfortunately, is almost up. It is up indeed. Uh, we have two more questions from the audience, but they are so wide that probably deserve another discussion or would you like to uh, answer them very, very briefly, just in a few sentences? Yeah, why not? Um, I'm perfectly happy to answer them if, if there yes. is time. Uh, one is from uh, Kristina Shumlakova. Um, she, she writes, I would be very interested to know the status and content of the 20th October mutual pledge. Well, I don't think we've got time to run through the, the terms of the pledge on the 20th of October, but I think we can just say that, in effect, it said the Union is still there, Lithuania is still an equal part of it, we have not destroyed the Republic of the Two Nations, and this just symbolizes what I said 
earlier that, that this was not a unitary state in which Lithuania had been incorporated into Poland. It remained a republic of two nations. So that, that would be my reply. And I can, I can answer Kristina separately about what it actually says later. <laughs> later. And we have another what if question from Marcin Gromnitsky. Would fogging a closer alliance with the Holy Roman Empire earlier on, on, on the Stanislav August train not have stopped Russian and particularly Prussian ambitions towards Poland? Well, the Holy Austria Roman Empire. Was... Yeah. Oh, Karen, no, you are. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to say that uh, clearly um, the whole Roman Empire was uh, was under the Habsburg uh, under Habsburg rule, and of course we know what uh, Maria Theresa did. You know the famous word that um, the, the, you know, she wept when she when, when she participated in the first partition of 1772, and the more she wept, the more she took. Um, so there was uh, absolutely no possibility for uh, for Poland to find a loyal. Uh, alliance with uh, the Holy Roman Empire. There was, of course, the idea of the Saxon uh, elector um, uh, succeeding as, as, as future king of Poland under, um, you know, a, a hereditary succession. Um, the, the general uh, opinion in Prussia, in particular, but also among the Austrians, was that that would not be uh, a very viable way. Uh, that uh, the, the, the 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 Saxon elector was uh, very very cautious uh, to accept any such position uh, because he was very much aligned with Prussian and Austrian uh, interests, or at least he didn't dare to really uh, divert from them uh, very much. Certainly not in favor of of, of Poland. So uh, I think that the situation looked fair fairly hopeless. And what has often been raised, of course, was that the Poles were a little bit naive about that. Uh, but I don't think they were naive. I think they were, they, they saw the situation very clearly. Um, but as I said earlier, you know, they didn't have many choices. Yeah, the, think, uh, perhaps you want to add something, Robert? <laughs> yeah, the, well, the Holy Roman Empire was not an entity that made alliances anymore. Exactly. That, was, that was one point. But, but also part of well, just to stress that another radical feature in, in the Polish-Lithuanian context of the constitution is that it makes the monarchy hereditary. In the 17th century, the free election of the kings had been the guarantee of our liberties, the Schlachter thought, but now it had changed that. But there was an idea which partly arose out of Prussia's initially favourable um, position yeah. with regard to reform, that because the elector of Saxony only had a daughter, the daughter would marry one of the sons of the King of Prussia, and that the Prussians would therefore become kings of Poland. But the Prussians betrayed that. And I see there's a question from Rutis Martikonis that about the lessons for today, and perhaps we might end by just saying that consensual systems are difficult, and it is very hard to get reform. Reform takes a great deal of time because various parties have been reconciled. But the lesson for today is that talking, discussion, can bring together parties that seem very far apart and can bring them to a consensus about how to reset the system. And that I think is an optimistic note and the most optimistic note. You've got to keep talking. You can't keep, alas, as politics seems to be coming today, shouting at each other from prepared positions and adopting extreme positions. Alas, we've seen the results of that in Britain and we are no longer part of the European family. And we might know from tomorrow, the elections in Scotland, what's going to happen to the British Union in the longer term. We don't know. Unions are difficult. Unions are hard. They depend on people talking to each other in good faith. And that's what happened in 1791. Poles and Lithuanians, and Lithuanians were great supporters. There was substantial support from Lithuanians for the constitution because they recognized that the mutual guarantee, uh, guarantee of 20th of October maintain the position of Lithuania as Ujelny, it says. Now, that's sometimes in modern Polish translated as sovereign. It doesn't mean sovereign in the sense that Lithuania was independent. It means it was up to a point subject to this new Ustava Zondowa, this new governing statute. It was autonomous and able to take control up to a point of Lithuanian interests and defend Lithuanian interests within this Republic of Two Nations. And I'll end there. I hope that answers your question, Rutis.
Thank you. Thank you for your wise words, optimistic note. Uh, thank you, Professor Frost, Professor Friedrich, Professor Przemyslov Żyravski Velgrajewski, Dr. Yolanta Karpavicene, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, for organizing this discussion. Now our time is really unfortunately up, but it's been great to hear so many uh, passionate. Uh, and still very relevant insights. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.